Hey everyone, I'm Stephanie, host and head bookologist here at the Get Literate Podcast. I'm a book-loving, notebook-hoarding reader and writer on a mission to change lives one book and one notebook at a time. On this podcast, we explore the power of bookology and leading literate lives. We talk all things books and reading and notebooks and writing mixed in with mindful practices and creativity to create lives we love. You can expect regular weekly episodes focused on three books you need to know about on a bookish theme and how to bring those themes to life in our actual lives too. You can also expect author interviews, notebooking inspiration, and topics to help us grow through what we go through and take inspired action to make our lives better. So grab a notebook and your TBR list and let's get literate. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Get Literate podcast. I'm Stephanie, your host, here to kick off a month-long celebration on the podcast. If you're listening in real time, then this is the first episode of March, and March happens to be National Reading Month, an entire month dedicated to reading and the power it can have in our lives. To celebrate, I've chosen a one-word theme for my own life, as well as my Get Literate Patreon community. And that one word theme is bibliolatry. Bibliolatry is the adoration of books, paying homage to books. In my community, we are reading our shelves all month long, sharing our favorites, thinking about the role reading can play in our lives, how to do a lot more of it, and what it can do for us too. To kick off our bibliolatry focus here on the podcast, I've invited Amanda Spencer to come chat with us. Amanda is a Get Literate listener who is like all of us, someone who loves to read, but she is reading for a reason. In fact, you might say she has a radical agenda for her reading life. Today, we'll talk about what that is, why it matters, and how reading can help us learn, unlearn, and relearn about the world and how it works. Amanda, welcome to the Get Literate podcast. So glad you're here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Ah, me too. Let's let's start with you. Why don't you give us a little background about yourself and a sneak peek into your reading life? Yes. Um, so I'm Amanda Spencer. I am a single mom of two. I'm a nurse by day. Um, I'm a vegan and a gym rat and a wildly <laughs> curious uh, person. And I just, I love learning. I tend to not read fiction books. I tend to read things where I'm learning something, whether that be, um, financial, personal finance, um, whether that be like mental organization, how to undo my chronic procrastination. Like Mm -hmm. I'm always learning something. Um, and so I just, I have loved your podcast and I'm really excited to, to join it today. I am too, because we have, we have a lot to talk about and we have a really important topic to talk about, you know, your reading life, as you described, it seems like it's filled with lots of nonfiction and real world information about how the world works. Although I could see myself recommending a few fiction titles for you based (laughs) on what you said alone in your introduction. So wait for an email from me after the episode because I've got okay (laughs) um but both of us regardless of the genre you read a lot of nonfiction. I read a lot of fiction but we both have this common purpose to read to learn to read to make life better to read to figure out the world and how it works and our place in it whether that is learning, unlearning, relearning, and and figuring all out again. Um, but you have a specific mission. And I, I love I love this mission that you have for your reading life. And it's both a a figurative mission and a literal one. So I mentioned to readers in the uh, opening that you have a radical agenda yes. for your reading life. But yes, then you also have a radical agenda. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so we're going to talk about both, but let's start with sure. the reading life side of it first. What does kind of having a radical agenda, this this purpose, this mission in your reading life, what is it and what does it mean to you? 
So um, I was homeschooled as a child and all the way through high school, actually. And my mom really focused on using what they call living books um, as opposed to textbooks. So I would read a lot of, I think that's probably where my love of nonfiction came from because it was a lot of nonfiction, like biographies and things less so history textbooks of on this date, this happened, on this date, this happened. So in 2020, when I left my husband and I was homeschooling my kids by myself through the pandemic, um, I focused a lot on what I knew, which was living books. And so we would go to the library all the time and find all sorts of books about real people uh, and kind of talk through those things. And what I started noticing with my kids who were five and two and a half at the time was that they would pick up on um, empathy and social justice or injustice and make comments like, wait a minute, that's not fair. Wait a minute, why are they treated like that? They're people too, they matter. Wait a minute, why is this happening? Um, and so we were doing that on our own. And it really challenged me also to start questioning things and wanting to learn from other perspectives as well. And so I started reading a lot, um, mostly in in audiobook format because my life is very busy, but I do have about 25 minutes of a commute time. Uh, and so I would pop in an audiobook and and learn while I drove each day. And that really, really helped. But it challenged me to kind of think outside of what I was raised in middle class, kind of on the upper middle class side of St. Louis. Um, and it was absolutely fascinating and it rocked my world. Yeah. Yeah, that is... I we have a lot of similarities there in that books, whether we listen to them or whether we read them um, can teach us that the world is not as we think, right? Yes. Because we don't know what we don't know. And depending on where we were raised, how we were raised, who we were raised by and what media books, television, all of that, that was put around us. We did grow up thinking that the world was a particular way. And unless you do something to put yourself outside of that space, then you can go on quite ignorant about how the world works for other people. And books, books offer this, this window. You know, Dr. Bishop has this mirrors, windows, and doors. And books give us these mirrors and windows and doors to enter in and to see something else, to see a different side. And I absolutely love as an educator that it was your kiddos that we're like, come up, come join us on, on this journey, because for them, it's, it's so natural to, to immerse themselves. It's so natural to question. It's so natural to be like, Hey, Hey, wait a minute. Right. Cause there always no filter, which is a right. really good thing. <laughs> childhood. And yes. then decided to join that journey along, along with them. What yeah. was, oh, go ahead. No, you go. <laughs> oh, I was just going to ask, what were some of those early topics or those early books that got you thinking, wait a minute, I, I need to, I need to read more. I need to learn more. Right. So, um, in, I mentioned that I live in St. Louis. So I was in St. Louis in 2014, um, when Michael Brown was shot. And so I had this idea and I thought that I knew about racial injustice having been here and just kind of absorbing some of the things that I had heard and learned about. And so then in 2020, after George Floyd, I thought, you know what, I really, really need to educate myself more about this, as I think most of the country did, you know, it was kind of a, a global awakening yeah. to injustice and, and social disparities. And so um, the first one that I read that I listened to, and all of these audiobooks, they're read by the authors. And I just think that there is something so magical about having a book be read by the authors because no one can impart the same kind of emotion and conviction as the people who write the words themselves. And so the first book that I wrote that I read was So You Want to Talk About Race by Ijoma Oluo. And that one just challenged me so much because she would say things about microaggressions that I had never thought of. And there were times where I was sitting there listening and I would feel myself going, wait a minute. No, I don't. 
oh, the point of this is for me to listen and for me to learn from a different perspective and to see how other people are feeling, not for me to defend myself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are, there are some things, there are so many microaggressions that my friends experience all the time. And I feel like it's my duty to also learn what those are so that I can avoid them. And so that's kind of, you know, I, I started reading to educate myself in order to be a better friend and better human to other people. The second one that I read was How to Be Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. He has an extensive catalog of books. Um, his book Stamped from the Beginning was actually his doctoral thesis. But I started off with How to Be an Anti-Racist. And again, it was very much going into the background of why these microaggressions are microaggressions or why just outright aggressions have happened and been just okay throughout the centuries and like all the background, the historical background of that. And I've learned so much history from both of those, that those are, those are really big for me. Yeah. Those, those are definitely powerful titles, I think for many. And I love what you mentioned about the audio because for some people reading these books, as you mentioned, you can have some reactions. You can have gut reactions of, well, wait, I don't, I don't do that. Or wait, wait, wait. And I think you made a really great point of when you are listening to the author speak. For me, it's different than reading the words alone. Like you said, there's a different level of emotion. I feel like there's a different connection that listening to author to the author tell their story gets you to stay there longer, gets you to realize that this is an actual connection that you could make. So I love that you not only push yourself to, to read in these titles to really grow your worldview in this way, but doing so by listening to authors just adds that other layer of connection I think that's a really interesting stance on this topic. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I think also I'm kind of an auditory learner mm -hmm. as well. So that helps it sink in differently versus I can get very distracted reading a book and then finish a book and be like, wow, that was really good and have zero <laughs> rec yeah. recollection of anything, but these books. And I, I think the titles too, like you said, they're, they're pretty powerful books. And I think a lot of people would have in common, like we don't consider ourselves racist. Mm -hmm. And so most people would say, I'm not a racist, but then there's a different level of anti-racism right. that is really impactful. And that's what I want to be focusing yeah. on. Yeah. So what is your third book? Um, uh, my third book is probably Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man from Emmanuel Acho. Again, it's read by the author, an audiobook format, and it's just it's all the questions that people have wanted to ask, but not wanted to sound racist. And so he kind of provided a safe way of, okay just throw them at me. Let's go. Let's talk about it. It's very relaxed and it's understandable. And he is not at all. Like he doesn't put blame on people for having these questions because he also understands that there's a systemic aspect to it as well. And it's just, it's ingrained in our society to where we don't even realize what is going on. Right. Right. Yeah. Again, I've heard such, uh, this is one I haven't read yet, but I have heard so much wonderful praise um, for this book to really raise those Im important issues in ways that can then move the conversation forward, which literally is, you know, in the title, uncomfortable conversations, you need them for growth. That's right. the only way you move out of your comfort zone is to have something uncomfortable. Um, so this is definitely one that is, is on my TBR. There's a lot of them on there for the month of March in the theology <laughs> theme, but that that is one that I think I'll I'll push to the top a little bit more because of our conversation here with you. Good. I know you'll love it. Yeah. So those are our three books where, you know, you're really exploring your understanding of, of race, 
um, especially in America, especially with a lot of the political injustice that we have going on. But I know you have another book that is an important one for you too. So tell us about that. Ooh, which one are we talking about? I think you so many titles. <laughs> true, that's true. This one um, was a queer history. Oh, of yes. States. Yes, a queer history of the United States actually was really, really fascinating for me and eye-opening because I think we hear a lot um, in the political spectrum of there haven't been this many people before who identify as LGBTQIA+. Um, and, you know, some some people will show graphs of, well, there haven't been this many left-handed people before either until we stopped making it a sin to be left-handed. Um, and so just learning how many people, a lot of whose names I recognized, identified somewhere within the LGBTQIA community and how those people have impacted our lives, sometimes in ways that we don't even recognize, um, but sometimes in, you know, they, they've pulled up and supported each other. They've grown communities. They've grown, um, Jane Adams is considered the mother of social work. And she is often thought to have been part of that community. There's no definitive answer, but she um, she created a community in Chicago for she was a wealthy woman and she she helped along with some other wealthy people fund this community in Chicago for low income and refugee families that taught English classes, they had child care, they had cooking classes, they had English classes, just really came around alongside people and helped them from a social net. And she was incredible. And so it was just really neat to see how people have influenced the course of history in our country, but also been part of this community that they kind of had to play under that in order to be accepted and to make their difference. And I just love when people are who they are and I want to celebrate people however they are um, and however that makes them feel most comfortable. And so that is a fascinating book to read as well. And I actually, I bought a copy for myself because it usually I get my books from the library and this one I felt was, was important enough that I needed to have my own reference. Yeah. Isn't that amazing how that works? There are so many of us where you're, our, our first line of action is the library, but then there are some that you just don't want to let go of. Mm -hmm. They need to have close by to see as, as reminders. And so I imagine having these titles visible, having them out, um, reminds you of your work, of your purpose, of your, your mission for, for your reading. Yes, it definitely does. So I will put a little bug in your ear that there are a couple of fiction books that <laughs> think maybe not do the same thing. Um, but what I love about fiction on this topic is that just like you enjoy listening to the author talk about their nonfiction work because you feel you feel part of it, you feel connected, you feel part of their story. There's just something about a fiction book that is so completely far removed from your own experience that allows you to just step into their shoes for a little bit. You know, I, I'm a middle-aged white woman. I will never know what it's like growing up to be a black boy in the United States. I will never know what it's like to be a world traveler. I will never know what it's like to have questions about sexuality or gender. Like, I, I just won't know. Therefore, I can't really understand and then act in a certain way. But if I read a book, if I read a book and I literally become that main character, which is what happens to so many of us when we read, we are just in it. We yes. are first. Then you, you start to develop that empathy in ways that you can't unless you have read those books. So I'm thinking of like The Vanishing Half. By okay. Bruce Bennett. I think you need to read that book. Um, that is a book about twin sisters, um, one who moves through life black and one who chooses to move through life passing as white and what that means 
And it raises okay. so many important things for us to think about, but it is a fiction story, but you are in it. You know, you're, you're living it. And as a person reading it, you can't help, but ask yourself so many questions about how the world works, just like you do in the nonfiction, because you're now part of their story. So that is one that I think you would like. And I also think um, the book, Melissa by Alex Gino, um, based on the last book we talked about is another one. This is, this is someone exploring gender and okay. the shifting, changing realities of that gender and what that means on the inside because of how the world is on the outside. So, so powerful. I, I feel like we almost need another episode where you throw a nonfiction book in the air and I throw a fiction book in the air <laughs> and, and they come together. But those are two that I think you should, you should add to your, to your reading list. Okay. Well, you know how they do have those, this wine pairs best with this book. Maybe you and I can come together with some sort yes. of an infographic of this nonfiction yes. and this fiction. Yep. A little book flight, a little tech set, a little, a little something I think would be, would be fun because we all need to talk about this work, but yes. some of us will have an easier time entering that conversation in a nonfiction way. And some of us might have an easier time entering it in a fiction storied way. So paired together, I think that would be a powerful punch. Definitely. I've heard it said that Fiction is learning through imagination and nonfiction is learning through information. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we need both. Yes. Oh, I love it. Okay. Before we talk about your physical radical agenda, we've talked figuratively <laughs> about your reading life. Before we talk about the physical piece, I would love to know the book you're reading right now. Yeah. So the book I'm reading right now is I Take My Coffee Black by Tyler Merritt. Um, admittedly, I had not heard of this man who had gone viral on his, on a video, um, that came out around George Floyd until he started dating one of my favorite authors, Jen Hatmaker. <laughs> That's how I found out too, because I just love Jen. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I love her. I follow her. We actually had very similar life paths starting in 2020. And so, I've just um, really enjoyed watching her grow and flourish and become who she is and so excited for her and Tyler. And so when I saw his book, when I did a bookstore tour, I love going to bookstores and kind of videoing through the independent bookstores. I found his book. And so I'm reading that now. And I just love how he opens with, you know, you might be racist and you might have all of these ideas about me, but if you really knew me, you wouldn't think that. So here is who I am and here is me and my background. And it's just so, um, so focused on empathy and what we have in common that I think is just so important right now. And so I just love it. And his style of reading, writing and speaking is just so engaging. Yeah. I love yeah. it so much. I want to read this book. I've read just about all of Jen's book, whether it's, you know, fierce, free, fire, simple and free for the love, feed the people, like all of them are books that, that I have read. Um, and so this is one that I want to get to. And what I love about, I guess when I found him through her books, through her feed is the giant megawatt smile of yes. this man <laughs> is just so inviting. Like you can't help but smile when you are scrolling through what they are saying and they're talking about important things, but it's such, it's so inviting. So I can only imagine that his book has that same feel because that's just what, that's just what put out there on the the media vibe, I guess. It's, I'm happy to know that that same spirit kind of shines through. It makes me want to get to it even more now. Definitely. And I had a little fangirl moment last week because I brought it to the park to watch my kids play and I snapped a photo of it and I tagged him on Instagram and Facebook and he actually wrote back to me. Isn't that the best? It was so fun. <laughs> it's like the, the reason I can tolerate social media is because we get to talk to authors and meet really cool people in ways that we never, ever, ever would. Oh, yes. I love that. Yeah, the degree of separation between me and really cool people just shrank yeah. so much <laughs> oh yeah I could totally relate there 
Okay, so let's let's actually shift to talking about the physical radical agenda. You've literally created an an agenda, a planner, a, a product called the radical agenda to help make sure that this kind of work that you're doing stays front and center in yes. in your life, in other people's lives. So I would love for you to tell us about that thing and what it can help us accomplish. Sure. So um, in 2021, my kid's school district landed on the cover of Time Magazine after a board of education meeting got very heated over the types of curriculum to include in the history classes. And so that was embarrassing um, for all the reasons why we landed on Time Magazine. I would love for it to be an awesome reason, not for an elementary school that I pass by daily to have issues of um, that, that they did. And so I was talking to my friends on Facebook and, and we were just chatting about how we thought it was absolutely ridiculous that certain parts of history that were, or were not included were considered a radical agenda. Like how dare you want to talk about these people or this topic or this event in history. Um, and so I was raised by a dad who loves dad jokes and I knew that agenda also meant planner. And I said, well, I'll create a radical agenda. It'll be a planner that has American history. I had no idea what I was doing. I just thought it was like a funny pun. And then I sat back and thought, actually, I could, I could do that. I could do um, that. Yes, I could do that. <laughs> I, I could do that. That, that could be something more than just a pun. And so I, of course, had no idea how to write a planner. I'd written books before and self-published, but this was different. And um, I am not a graphic design person by any means of the imagination. And so I spent countless hours on YouTube and looking at different, you know, how to create a planner and then how to design it and pouring over different fonts because I didn't realize that that was important. Um and so then I ended up creating a planner that has kind of on this date in history scattered throughout. They change every publication. Um, and then every month features what I call a monthly learning moment, which is just a short essay on a person or a topic or an event in history that I think needs more attention than it has gotten. And I've really been able to grow my own understanding of history. And, you know, I've always been told that, that history is just kind of this stream and, and puzzle and it's never made sense to me it's always been very disjointed and this day is this and this day is this and um you know why are these things connected and I realized that I was missing a lot of puzzle pieces and so as I have been learning of like oh that this law was passed and then that had repercussions over here and that's why this was happening and I'm I'm getting the flow more and I'm understanding more and so I really want to share that with other people as well and then it just kind of grew from there and exploded. In the best possible way. <laughs> In the best possible way. So who is the agenda for? Is it for history buffs? Is it for someone who just wants to know a different side of things? Is it for people who just love planning? Like, do you, do you see, because in my mind, I could see it working for all of those people. Yeah. So it, it, it really is a, a planner for anyone who wants to bring more of this content or awareness or curiosity perhaps in, into their life. Is that who you yes. see it ending up in their hands? Yes. And I, I do have an adult's version and I have a child's version and the child's version is always on a biography of someone. Maybe they'll learn about them in school. Maybe they won't. Maybe they'll learn certain aspects of this person in school and they won't learn all of the other really cool things about them. Um, and so I want to be able to share that and highlight that. And I focus majority on people within the LGBTQ plus community, people um, who do not share the same skin tone as I do, mm -hmm. and just kind of enjoy learning about all the people and what makes them awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So give me an example. What's one person that a child might encounter in their planner? Um, I had a monthly learning moment on Wilma Mankiller, who was one of the first woman chief uh, to create incredible laws and funding for 
the nations um, that included fresh water. She helped create clinics, health clinics for people on reservations. She was just really, really powerful woman. Well, it's a name that I didn't know. So I certainly would be a kid excited to learn about, about someone new there. How about a, a topic we might find in the adult planner? In the adult planner, um, I wrote about the California genocide, which actually was something that inspired, let's see, hold on, I was thinking of something else. I want to, the March on Washington was fascinating. Let's do the March on Washington. Okay. So in August of this year, my monthly learning moment is on the March on Washington which we all kind of know as the Martin Luther King Jr. I have a dream speech location. There was so much else that went into that and it was actually organized by Bayard Rustin who was a gay black man back when it was very dangerous to be either of those things, he was both. And he actually, um, when, when Martin Luther King Jr. tapped him to organize this, they came up against a lot of, um, a lot of concern that that's who was running it and it ended up being wildly successful. It was just a really, really neat story. They actually, Netflix has a new, a new movie called Reston about him. So I really, I liked that one. And I also liked learning about how the March on Washington wasn't necessarily just about civil rights. I think we hear about, or, you know, the, anti-segregation. I think as a child, I kind of absorbed it as the, I have a dream and everybody's marching for, you know, just to be accepted, but how were they being accepted? The official title of it was the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. They wanted the same access to jobs as white people had, and they wanted the same access to rights as white people had. And I think that it being so specific kind of like the jobs and freedom part kind of got washed away in the retelling of the story. And so to come back and be like, this was the very specific purpose that they were fighting for. Yeah. So you're giving us the backstory behind the story to yes. these, these events and these topics. Yes. I well, love the backstories. Yeah, I do too. And I love planners and I love, <laughs> Good. And I love anything that gives me a tangible reminder of the things I love, the things that are important to me, the things that I want to learn. I mean, the planner industry is huge for a reason. And this planner allows you to get really specific. Yes, for your reading life to remind you that you can read outside of the boundaries that you're currently in. But just as a reminder that what we think we know might not actually be the only version. And so this gives you the opportunity to keep that front and center. Yes. And I do have something really fun in each of the planners. Every monthly learning moment has a QR code at the bottom. And when you scan the QR code, it actually takes you to a page on my website with that topic and additional resources. So if you want to learn more books about Wilma Man Killer, you have them. If you want to learn more about Bayard Reston and the March on Washington in general, you have them. I love QR codes. So I love that. <laughs> I love being able to just scan and get the information um, that I want. I want to leave you with one last book recommendation. Okay. Because you love planners, because you literally created an, an agenda. Um, there's a book that I have fallen in love with. I've mentioned it a little bit on the podcast. I'm going to have a whole episode dedicated to it soon. It's called Your Perfect Year by mm -hmm. Charlotte Lucas. And the premise of the book is that in the very beginning, this main character finds someone's agenda, um, finds someone's planner on New Year's Day um, for the coming year. So they find their brand new planner and it is completely filled out. Every day is already set of what this person's life was supposed to look like. And this person tries everything he can to find the creator of it to give the person back their planner and can't. And instead decides to live his life according to what this person thought should be the perfect year. And I think you would love it just because you make planners. And this yes. whole book is about the perfect year in planner form. So there you go. One more book to add <laughs> to your, to your TBR. 
I love that. I love that. I'm such a planner person that in college, one of my friends took my planner as a prank and I chased him around the whole building. <laughs> so I was like, that's my brain. I don't know what I'm doing without it. Yeah. yeah. That person <laughs> crossed the line. We get that. We get that. That person crossed the line. So this has been a, a, a lot of fun talking about the books that have mattered most to you, talking about your purpose for your reading life, especially as we're celebrating National Reading Month. For those that want to see that agenda, they want to get their hands on it. They want to grab it. Where can they find you? What's the best place? So my website is theradicalagenda.com. And I will have a banner with a wait list. My academic year version is going to be launching April 1st, which is also my birthday. So oh, I like to do things on my birthday. <laughs> I'm the sixth. So we're, we're pretty close. Oh, we're very close. Yeah. <laughs> So I will be launching that soon. One thing that I definitely want to mention about the planners is that these stories that I tell are not from my own community. They are very much to highlight the um, Black, Brown, Indigenous communities, the LGBTQ communities, Asian communities, everybody that I'm not a part of. These are not my stories. And so to honor that, to respect that, I donate a large portion of Proceeds, not profits, but proceeds to um, nonprofit organizations. And those change every year. But for 2024, I'm supporting We Sow, We Grow, which is an urban farming initiative in Chicago. And also RIP Medical Debt, which helps erase medical debt for people. So those are, are two things that are close to my heart that I want to make sure, you know, I still have yet, I'm two years into this, but building it in the nooks and crannies of the single mom working life. It's um, a little bit slow to grow, but I I still have not made a profit with these planners. And I, when I do get a little bit for my own cut, I tend to give it away anyway. Mm -hmm. So my goal is to raise a thousand dollars total and to support 500 to each organization uh, between now and August. Well, I bet you we have some listeners who would love to support a cause or causes like that. And so I will put links to your website and where they can find you online to make it really easy for them to find you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. This has been a, a wonderful conversation. What a great way to kick off the, the month of celebrations. And for everyone listening, thanks for tuning in to another episode. Next week, I'll have an episode celebrating books about books in order to fuel, fuel our bibliolatry focus this month. So stay tuned for there. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Get Literate podcast. You'll find links to all the books, resources, and ideas mentioned in the show notes and at alitlife.com. Plus, if you want more, you might like to join my Patreon community. There, you'll find additional inspiration for your reading and writing life, like bonus podcast episodes, bibliotherapy book calendars, monthly book clubs, notebooking challenges, live events, giveaways, and much, much more. It's only $5 a month, and you get instant access to all of the previous content, too. You can learn more at getliterate.co. And one more thing. If you love what you listen to today, please take a moment to rate and review the podcast or take a screenshot of the episode and text it to a friend. This helps the podcast grow and builds our bookish and notebookish community too. Thanks for listening.